I just want to say a big thank you, Jazakallah, for the amazing, amazing turnout. Alhamdulillah, it's amazing to see so many of you here today. Um, we're very grateful to Sister Sol as well for being here with us. Um, inshallah, today's talk is going to be a very open discussion, inshallah. Um, I'm going to start f uh, ahead with a few questions and then inshallah we'll open it up to the floor as well. Um, now today's talk is very exciting. Um, it's going to be about how to be a happy Muslimah, which is a Muslim woman in Islam and how to stay happy as well in 2024. Now we're going to be touching on topics of feminism as it's a very hot topic recently and also um, what Islam's perspective is on feminism as well as touching on the reality of uh, love and marriage as well as well as uh, the beauty of modesty as well as the challenges that come along with it as well and overall we'll wrap up with the main challenges for uh, Muslim women in 2024 um, and inshallah I'll pass it on to the soul for a bit of an introduction of herself and then I'll continue on with the first question Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Um, I am mostly known as either Um Salahuddin or Sister Soul. Um, many of you, maybe not you right now, but have discovered me on the Ali Da'wa's podcast, Bitter Truth. And we covered topics like divorce, healing, gender roles. And I think it was very interesting to have the views of the sisters and the brothers and see like how we definitely think differently, how Allah created our mind differently, and we are struggling sometimes to get to understand each other. And I think it's very important we bring those bridge and those conversation to inshallah um, better the communication. Oh yeah, I forgot to say, <laughs> I work as well, or used to work for five years for Medina Paris, so modesty is something extremely important. It's a website for we designed, me and my twin sister, jilbabs, hijab, khimar, and it's something I'm very passionate about because of my story. I come from France, maybe for the one that already picked up the French accent, and it was quite a journey. And I think we, very often here, when I came to the UK, I saw that modesty was really taken as granted. But when you fought for it, when you sacrificed family, studies, friend, work, you're not gonna let it go easy. You, you, you have kind of a passion. That's the reward, inshallah. Alhamdulillah. Um, so we're going to start off with the first question. We're going to keep it quite open. Um, we want to discuss how has Islam changed um, lives for women? And how um, would you explain that, inshallah? rahman uh, rahim So I think it's very important that we do realize, or maybe we didn't realize, that Islam has gave us the formula, formula for happiness for brothers and sisters, especially women that was they were quite unhappy if you compare islam let's just compare it very quickly with other civilization let's start with the babylon civilization in under the babylon civilization believe me or not if a husband commit a crime kill someone else they used to punish the wife yeah no <laughs> weird but that was the, the the spirit at the time so it's quite funny to see how they perceive us and they forget a bit about the history I think it's very important we mention the Greek. The Greek had to, they had like a female representation. She was called Pandora. And she was a representation of the evil of the society. If anything happened, it's because of her. I know many men will recognize themselves. But it was like a, um, a mindset that the woman was always responsible. And she was always only useful for the pleasure of the men. That's it, nothing else. And if we cover as well the Roman society, the man, the husband, was allowed to kill his wife. He will not be judged, he will not be in trouble. He just had enough of her, he would just kill her and won't get in trouble. Imagine the lower statue that the, 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 obviously the women and the daughters growing up in societies like that, like how oppressive it must have been, subhanAllah. And obviously Christian society used to believe that Hawa was responsible for Adam being tempted and it was always her fault from, 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 from the start. And she didn't have a soul. They find out that she had a soul, I think, in 19th centuries, if I'm not wrong. Something like that, but very late compared to uh, Muslims. You have to understand that the Prophet, as 1400 years ago, he started with the worst of the society. Because I spoke about Babylon, I spoke about Roman, I spoke about Greek, but Arabic society were the worst. They used to bury alive daughters. It's just to show you the lower value and the lower esteem they had for women 
or girls, it was a curse for them. And subhanAllah, when you observe what the Prophet ﷺ brought to the Ummah and brought to the women, they became the most higher women of all societies at the time, from the worst one to the better one. And the Prophet ﷺ gave us those rights and gave us those values. I know that sometimes, when I started to practice, it was very, very difficult because me coming from an Arabic background, we have a, obviously we have the culture, you have the deen, and you have the culture and the tradition. And the way it was translated to us, the way it was transmitted to us, unfortunately, we were lesser than a boy. Or we like had more demand. We needed to be more perfect than the boys. We needed to do more and serve and serve and serve. And no one really explained to us the purpose. And when I started to practice, this is when I found my value. Alhamdulillah, I mean, our parents are just victims of whatever like their parents teach them. So I don't blame them. Uh, my mom, most likely, she was a victim as well of this kind of like um, vision. There was nothing to do with Deen. It was obviously traditional and yeah. Every culture has their own like um, view of women. But to see how the Prophet, when I studied the history, no one told us at school how the Roman, how the Babylon, and how the Christian used to see the women compared to the Muslim at the times. You know, like, women were very, were very elevated. We were scholars. We were very, like, appreciated, respected. We had rights. The women at the time, if you think in the Western society, they had to pay to get married. Can you imagine? You're going to get married, you're going to serve a man, you're going to give whatever you, your best years of your life, you're going to, you know, and happily, alhamdulillah, but you're going to have to pay on top of that. And Islam came and changed that. Because obviously you're paying the, 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 the dawri, I think, the, how you say? Dawri. The mahar. mahar. Oh, yeah, the mahar. The mahar is as well a compensation for the time that the wife's going to invest in you. The love, the patience, the, the service that she's going to make your life supposedly easier. I know, not everyone will agree with that. But that was the, the, the situation. And I think one of the things for all of us that we struggled when we started the Dean, and we started to really embrace. In France, it's different. We have a different history than here. When you want to wear the hijab, you better be very motivated. You better be very, how can I say, convinced. It's not like, hey, I see many sisters growing up with the hijab, and sometimes they lose the sense of it. They lose the sense of the chance they have, or the honor they have of being Muslim. And I think it's me when I started, it was like, I didn't understand why the hijab, hijab didn't really exist in my environment at the time. It was kind of a rare thing. And I was thinking like, covering the hair, for what? Like, for me, the beauty of a woman, maybe her face, her character, but the hair, I didn't get it. But then, because I worked on my tawheed, and I started to realize that Allah Azza wa Jal is al-haq, he is the truth. There is no truth above him. And he's al adil he's the just one. Meaning that everything that comes from him is good for us. Sometimes it's just us misunderstanding why Allah Azza wa is forbidding this thing or that thing. I felt oppressed at the time because French girls, like they were allowed to, you know, go to parties, birthdays, at night, you know, like do whatever they want with their hair, dress the way they want. And I wanted to be like them. But I found like, oh, my parents are so backwards. And, because they didn't explain to us. That was the ni'am of Islam, protecting our honor, our dignity. And let me tell you one thing, sisters. If there is one thing you must treasure thing, it's not even your husband, it's not even your kids, it's not even like your statue, your money, your house, it's your dignity and your sense of honor. And I think like in those days, they're trying to brainwash us. And I was the most feminist you can even find because I was trying to fight those injustice in my culture. And I became like a hardcore feminist. And believe me or not, my story of the hijab started with me defying my father. My father wasn't really practicing. We were watching, and he started to forbid the hijab at school. That was like, I'm telling you the story, it was like 15 years ago. The first cases of girls being kicked out because they wanted to wear the hijab. And, and that was like college or... And my father made a comment like, oh, they want to forbid like the hijab, it's haram, whatever. And I looked at him and I was like, yeah, I know, I was very <laughs> brave. <laughs> because I told him, like, no, Abby, like, the hijab was invented by the men to submit the woman. And believe me or not, yeah, I said that. And he was like, no, check in the Quran yourself. Because he wasn't that, like, he couldn't tell me, yeah, he wasn't really that practicing. 
And I was like, okay, I define him and I said, I'm going to prove to you that you are wrong. And this is how my journey to Islam started, believe me or not. From the nafs, you know, like trying to, I was trying to fight for women's rights. I was trying to fight for oppression. Allah knew my intention. And he guided me to the truth with me looking for the ayah and finding it and realize now I have to wear it, <laughs> you know? Because Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, each one of us have been guided differently. And we all differently, the brothers have their own struggles, our sisters have their own struggles, but it's to understand that the formula is right there in the Quran. We just didn't understand how amazing, how blessed we are. You know, in the hard days of hijab, we all have them. And we are thinking like, and I kept thinking like, Allah is haq. If I wear it, I will understand the sense. I, I didn't understand it at the time. If I submit to Allah Azza wa Jal, Allah will give me the fahm, the comprehension of it. And this is exactly what happened. I understood the hijab after wearing it, believe me or not. I didn't understand at the time, it was like, and for me, like clothing was very important at the time. I was like, this doesn't go with my style, it doesn't go with my color theme or whatever it was. And then slowly, slowly, hijab became the center. Like, and I, I started to study the rules of the hijab. Actually, there are six, and very often people do not know about it. Like, um, this, if you cannot pray in a piece of cloth, you cannot get out with it. And that was my philosophy from day one. And you know, France situation, racism, Islamophobia, we sacrificed a lot. So many people will say like French sisters, like they don't joke with the hijab. Yeah, like, you know, Algerian, it's because we sacrificed everything for it. You know, it wasn't easy for my mom. Um, I had to change completely the course of study. I couldn't study anymore. And alhamdulillah, it was like worth it. But alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah, um, that was a very, very comprehensive answer. Um, now, you mentioned a lot of words, especially feminism. And I think yeah. feminism is a very big, hot topic. And it's something that we struggle to understand as Muslim women and just as women in general. Um, and so feminism is, uh, feminism is actually described as um, the advocacy of equal rights for women in the Western mm. world or across the mm. world. So what is Islam's take on feminism? Is, does feminism exist in Islam? And is feminism is it a way of oppression or is it actually liberation for us women in today's world? I'm going to be honest with you, and I think many maybe sisters or brothers maybe, I used to believe in feminism. I, was a, I, I used to say that Islam is the more feminist religion you can find because they invented that word, you know. Feminism is something that is already included, if it is the meaning that we mean in terms of equality. But the way they made us, they chove our throat, like feminism, what it is and we have to fight for, actually was destructive. And I can tell you from my own journey to detoxify from feminism, it took me a while to realize like, subhanAllah, we are fighting for feminism, but we're not fighting for the rights, for better right that Allah has gave us. If you see how feminism is translated today, what they're asking our women? Anyone? What is feminism? From your perception or from the society perception? Any answer? Yes, why not? Bismillah. I would say that it's a, um, people probably they say that it's empowering women, meaning that they want women to be like men. Empowering women, which it, this is what they made us think, okay? We know the, the other definition, we know it today. But the first definition, another sister? So he said empowering women. How did you define feminism? The way it was beautifully introduced to you. Okay. We can't do the same thing, so they want women to be a copy paste. And Jazakallahu khair. My issue with feminism today, and how I've understood it, I really needed to, to debunk like the notion. Like I went back to dictionary, same when it comes to masculinity, how they made us hate the word masculinity and they associated with toxic. And how they replace femininity by by feminism. And I was like, why no one using the word femininity? Femininity is all the beautiful attributes to a woman. Feminism is literally copying a man. And we are not men. You see how we are hurting ourselves? It's either imitating or either being appealing to men. Those are the two sides of feminism. 
in both sides it's either appealing by your clothing by your makeup by the way you talk the way you act you know and they call that femin feminism I, I don't call it feminism I call that submission I call that oppression because you are only defined by the way the men look at you if you are defined as cute as beautiful you are accepted you are feminine no that's very oppressive for the one that do not feel like appealing or accepted or validated by the men again the, feminism is the most anti femininity and anti women's right and women's hack and woman nature you can even find I, for me it was mind blowing how i was on a journey of self destruction because i was trying to exist to like he mentioned empower myself through the way that men were empowering themselves i'm not a man it took me a while to realize that but i'm not a man and, and it was hard because i was like but no but this is what they told us like i'm going to study i'm going to do martial arts like them i'm going to like be strong i'm not going to cry like leave me alone let me cry i'm a woman let me embrace that let me embrace that rahma let me embrace that fragility no i cannot climb a mountain leave me alone you do it on your own <laughs> or you climb me there but that's really that now my new philosophy i am in total acceptation the fact that i am a woman and it doesn't mean i'm weak i like created me differently i'm stronger than a man on different things but i don't need to be as strong as them on their own favor that allah azza wa jalla favor them if allah azza wa jalla favor men physically it's because they have to provide for their family it's because they have to endure a lot more than women if you think about how islam define us we are princess we are princess let's just be honest and if you ask any hard working feminist woman she will tell you i want to marry a qatari man in dubai i don't want to work i don't want to do anything i want to have like servant and that was islam is encouraging to ask any hard working woman that has been working in the fields of men for 10 years there is not one of them that will tell you oh this is beautiful i'm very happy i'm like i don't have any mental health issues like i'm feeling like i don't know on top of the world but it's such a false feeling we are um running away from our fitra our fitra is our femininity we are becoming men and men are becoming weak sometimes it's related sometimes women as well they had to go into the masculinity because they had to survive absent fathers absent husbands absent brothers because when you have a strong leadership in a household it allows you to go and root into your femininity to be weak to be like daddy's girl to be like you know you, your husband most precious protective little thing but sometimes we're not allowed to be that and i think that's as well brothers need to take accountability when it comes to that but we need to take accountability too society has given us power that is destroying in us we are not being empowered and this is what i find it extremely oppressive we have to become and i'm going to tell you one thing you know what i find the masculine toxicity i don't think it existed there is nothing toxic about masculinity i know i always shock my audience when i say that because if you look in the dictionary masculinity is all the traits of a man protective caring providing there is nothing toxic about that i'm sorry bring it like it's it's all good you know it's like it's like saying toxic femininity there is nothing toxic in a woman being a woman to the contrary and the only ma uh, toxic masculinity is the one we women have to develop this is extremely toxic for our body for our fitra for our happiness for our mental health we do not work like them they do not work like us by us forcing us to work like them this is what feminism is asking you and they only pretending to give you liberation it's more exploitation they just want more workforces when you look at the origin of the feminism it was by men men wanting women to feel free ah, i can work and do things and what happened to the men's salary they got cut if you look in the history and financially how is i impacted men he has cut the salary by two and they really started to struggle to provide for the women because women has taken space and now they want equality it's not equality if you're not taking into consideration the fact that we are different you are forcing me to be empowered through someone that is very different from me so of course i'm going to suffer 
you know, and we all know about the sleeping patterns of women, how it is very different from men's. Our hormones change like our cycle 28 times a month, only once for them, or I can't remember the exact numbers, but it's really by definition asking us to be something that we are not and is really hurting us. We start to act like a man, to talk like a man. We are very defensive. We are very, you know what I'm saying, like all this masculinity is affecting. We are the masculine toxicity. Jazakallah. Um, I think you talked a lot about your struggles and uh, you mm. moved from France uh, to this country and it's very two big demographics, different demographics as well. And subhanAllah, may Allah reward you and your family Ameen, and, Ameen, Ameen. Ameen, and all the, the women in France that are currently struggling as well. Um, I mean, but it feeds nicely into the next question, which is um, what do we take granted um, for uh, as Muslim women when it comes to the beauty of modesty and what are the, some of the main challenges that we face when it comes to wearing the hijab and, and modesty in general? I think we, we go back to what we mentioned before, the fact that we take things as granted. But it's not only the hijab we take as granted, we take our salat as granted, we take the freedom of practicing our deen, we take our food and we can see with the Gaza situation is reminding us every single day you know like subhanallah like what hurt me like and I hope inshallah it was a reminder for many sisters like the first thing that the sisters brought out of rubbles in Gaza was ammi ammi hijabi hijabi and I thought like wow us for whatever reason because of nafs because of passion because we don't feel integrated we started to lower the hijab summer just bring the summer out and the hair is out and you know, we want a bit of breeze in our neck. And I was thinking about this woman like being under the world rubble. And even the young girl, like the first thing that came to her mind wasn't to breathe air, it was like cover me, cover me, I'm me, cover me. And that really, really like should hit us hard, like the way we are perceiving um, modesty. And I think just like everything, when we go back to our tawheed, and we understand that Allah is al-Adil, Allah is al-Haq. You understand that everything has, the society is showing us today. Feminism is completely crumbling. Unfortunately, we have as well another extreme that feminism has created is the red pill. Our brothers, as, from a non-Muslim perspective, unfortunately, are going excessively, are angry. They feel unheard. They feel like um, they don't know their place. They don't have their rights and they go into the extreme. So I'm hoping the sisters, inshallah, to free themselves from this mentality because Islam has gave us so much more. We don't need to be a man to be loved by Allah Azza wa Jal. We don't need to be not even married, not even have kids, not even rich, not even study. I know education is a big thing, but this doesn't validate who you are as a woman, as a Muslimah. Allah Azza wa Jal, He's al wadud and he's the source of love. And that's why I really often in all my talks mention love. Because the source of everything is love. Why women wants to be like this or like that or wants to be beautiful is because they want to be loved. Why men are acting a certain way, they believe it or not, they want to be loved. Maybe differently than women, but they want to be loved. And when we realize in this journey, and I take that uh, that the fact that we um, go back to the fact that we take things as granted, we take Allah as much as granted. Let me tell you that. We take his listening as granted. We take his ni'mah as granted. We take his love as granted. And when you have understood that Allah Azza is al-wadud, you will link to all your ibadah. Everything he says is haq. Meaning, when Allah Azza wa stop us from, from exposing ourselves, what do you think it is? Why Allah Azza wa is asking us to cover? Is to allow me to speak here without being abused by men that are sick in the heart. It's for me to be respected. It's for me to be honored. I thought for a while that it was to be hidden or to be suppressed, you know, like just sh like muted away. And then I realized I've never felt so free than when I covered. Because I knew that I'm gonna be hurt for what I have to say. I do not need to be beautiful. In a society of overexposure, when women and our sisters and you, all of you, are suffering from mental health because you, your self-confidence is affected, because you feel not beautiful enough, because you want to be like the TikTok girls, and let's just be honest, even if we don't really want to be like them, but we kind of influence in the back of our mind, like, oh, you know, my nose is not as sharp as her, my body is not as her, and it affects men as well. I'm, I'm saying women, because obviously we are more emotional when it comes to that. It affects our brothers, you know? 
differently when men like you, you see this whole trend with gym things they have their self-confidence issue as well but we sisters are a lot more affected and when we understand how hijab plays a role because we very understand that oh it's mainly for the men we like it's for the men not to look at us whatever but it's even for ourselves we're protecting our nafs the hijab when i wear it or even more than yaqab i'm protecting myself i'm thinking this morning oh how i'm gonna look like no it doesn't matter because you're gonna listen to me no matter what if i am covered properly it doesn't matter like you're not gonna be fixated on this or that you're going to be focused on my talk and I'm going to be appreciated or validated for who I am. Really, like I'm really, ah, oh, sorry, my French is kicking in. But what I'm trying to explain that Islam has accepted the diversity. Just look at the Sahabiyat. I think that's a beautiful example. When you look at the diversity of Sahabiyat, they were all different. You had businesswomen like Khadija Radiro and her at a time when they used to bury women, please. Look how the Islam has changed things. When the Prophet married the woman, and I looked at all the... Yesterday I was like going through my reading. I was like, Ajib. He married women from different size, different color, different age, different race. Is that... If that's not like equity and like diversity, please. He, married, he had Fatima Radlu and she was a housewife. And still she came to the Prophet She complained that obviously the hard work, like... You know, she wanted a servant and this. And what did the Prophet say? He promised her Jannah. If she would do this, if she said her Afkar, I think it was Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah. Yeah. And he was like just giving the haq to the housewife. And yet he gave her the promise of glad tidings. He told her she will be from the woman of Jannah. The, she, the chief, I read that, I don't know if it is true, but I have to verify that the chief of the ladies in Jannah for being a housewife, how today with the great housewife, the most beautiful role that we have. It doesn't mean you can't do something else, but our first priority, our first honor job is to serve our, and, and you ask any hardworking woman, she will tell you, I would rather be at home, taking care of my kids, my husband, have a beautiful house, clean and cook, that's all I want. Because this is in our fitrah. But they're trying to fight our fitra. And you have other women, like Khadija radiallahu anha. She was a businesswoman. You had women like Um Salama. She was a political advisor, please. The Prophet would take her word over the one of the Sahabi. It shows equity, meaning that men, obviously, they were good fighters and everything, and good fighters, Nusayba. Nusayba radiallahu anha. Like, oh, um, I forgot her name. Uh, I think it was Urmaisa. One of the Sahabiyyat, subhanAllah, they were attacked at one of the battle. You know when the archers left their, left their position? They exposed the woman camp. My sisters, my brothers, she picked up a pole, a wooden pole. You have to understand, the tent were massive because obviously all the women were there. A massive pole against seven men. She killed them all. Killed the seven enemies of Allah on her own. She was the niece of Khalid ibn Walid. What does it show you? It makes sense. But Khalid ibn Walid had to teach her the skills. You know, like how today is like maybe in our culture, like no aid for you. We don't learn the fighting skills. It's just for the boys. You know, you don't need it. She was taught and look at the Qadr of Allah. She defended the honor of all the women of the camp. She grabbed, I don't know if you realize, a pole. And I think she was pregnant at the time, but I'm not sure. She grabbed a massive wooden pole. It was extremely heavy. I wouldn't even, and take it out of the ground. Take it out of the ground, just for a start. How she found the strength? She had the skills. She was taught the skills, and there was nothing aib in it. Each woman needs to be appreciated for her own skills. You have your skills, I have my skills, you have yours, and you have yours. But Islam is accepting each one of you. You do not have to look like them to be validated or appreciated. And I am a happy like mother at home, and I do not wish to work. I did that and I have seen the struggle, the pressure, the mental health, how it degraded. And I was like, I am out of my water, you say in English? Yeah, yeah out, of, depth. out of my depth. Yeah, exactly. I, you say it better than me. <laughs> <laughs> I might say something wrong. I, I was out of my depth, like in, 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 a, in a sense, like, and I was good at it. I was good, I was doing it. I was a good businesswoman. I was a good, I, was, I always felt I was better at hard working outside than inside because I was trying to fight this 
until I embraced, like I was like, you know what, I have limitation. I don't need to do all that. I don't need to be this to be accepted. Because when I fixed my relationship with Allah Azza wa and my Tawheed, he, he freed me. You know what, because when you, Tawheed came into, it wasn't only taught to men, Tawheed was taught to women. Maybe even first through Khadija radiallahu anha. For what? To liberate her. Liberate her from, the, from her own struggle, from the standards of the society, from oppressive men, from oppressive society. As Tawheed today is freeing all the society and all the Muslims, hopefully, inshallah, I know some are still struggling with it, drugs is an enslavement. Money is an enslavement. Society is an enslavement. I'm going to dare say even love can be an enslavement. And when you put Allah Azza wa Jal before everything, remember he's al wadud is al ahad and you have to love him, all the love that comes after is healthy. We all have a baggage of unhealthy love. The way we've been brought up, the way our men emotion have been suppressed. I'm not talking about crying men all day long. I'm just saying like for them to be able to express that they are unhappy, they are struggling and they can count inshallah hopefully on the woman to be a support, to be a listener because this is how we, because we think feminism has broken women, it has broken men as well because men in all those 20 last years, they've been, they've just been packed on one side, just play your PS4, your PS5 or whatever or Xbox or Sega, whatever it was and just stay in you like, they didn't give them any responsibility. But that's against their own fitra. Men are made in the fitra to protect the woman. But then the society said, oh no, 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 don't protect. You've been abusive. You've been like too much. When the only thing they want is in the fitra, you know? And this is why like when, even when you speak about the women and the children of Gaza, we have to remember to pray for our brothers as well there. How hard it must be to see you whole family being attacked and not being able to defend. Wallahi, it's another level of pain. You know when you're a woman, or when you're, you're just like, you, you, you are taking the pain, and, but when you're a man, there is your pain and there is the pain of your family, of your mothers, of your parents. It's just like a mother not being able to protect her child. This is how men feel for their, for their family. And I think it's very important, inshallah, that we remember them like in our du'as. But I just want to really go back to Tawheed and explain when we embrace Islam al haq Islam always wanted us to protect us from bad things. Mixity, when it comes to, you know, like a man and a woman, like being alone. Allah has actually gave us rule, because Allah knows this society is lying to us. It's basically lying to us, and people are realizing with the World Cup in Qatar, with Gaza, they are admiring Muslim society. And we were admiring them for the past, I don't know, century, wanted to be like them, our countries wanted to be like them, and now we are going back. Look at the people that went to Qatar World Cup. No alcohol, like, you know, orders and cleanness. And we are the inspiration today. You know how Allah Azza wa Jal, like, changed the powers? You have to understand that. There is an ayah of the Quran that says that like, uh, Allah changed the powers like day and night, something like that. That he changed, like, for example, the powers were the men's, now it's the women, and inshallah it goes back to the men. And the same for Islam. You know, Islam was like being put like six foot on the ground and insulted and humiliated. And now, wallahi, alone, just with Gaza, with Gaza, people are falling in love again with Islam. People are reverting and they're realizing they were lied to their whole life. And yeah, that's one of the things like I wanted to fix, like how we should be proud, how we should embrace our hijab. And I always often say to my sisters, like, kiss your hijab, hug it. Don't think like, I know very often we see it as a burden, but you have to understand what hijab is bringing to you. Hijab is bringing you freedom, identity, existence, even above the standards of society. It's allowing you to speak up. It's allowing you to do things for the ummah without having the abuse that comes very often with a woman in a, in a men environment. And it allows, it's allowing you to do things. Alhamdulillah. Um, Jazakallah. I think, um, yes, in this society you mentioned like 
uh, there's feminism as well as um, democracy as well, they try to, to pump a lot of different solutions, but all in all, conclusively, um, Islam is what provides women and men liberation. Liberation. Liberation, exactly. alhamdulillah. Um, but inshallah, what we're going to do is we're going to open up the floor to any questions. Um, we have a Slido active as well, so inshallah, if you're too shy to ask any questions, you can pop them on there. Um, otherwise, if you'd like to put your hands up and ask questions as well, that would be amazing. Um, the Slido uh, number is 368-2060. So it's 368-2060. Please feel free to ask any uh, question that you feel that are private for you and you, you have the, mashallah, the advantage of being anonymous and anything that can help you in whatever struggle you have, my brothers or my sisters, um, I'd be happy, inshallah, to advise. But one of the things I will advise you, inshallah, one of the most healing, you know, we spoke a lot about Tawheed and I think it's very important that we re-appreciate the fact that we are Muslims. You are Muslims and we are Muslima. Appreciating your libes, appreciating your, maybe sometimes your tradition, appreciating where you come from, appreciating that our countries, I mean, for some of us, not for the reverse one, but for some of us, our countries were colonized for their richness, for our culture, they tried to destroy it. And now the whole thing is coming against them because feminism is breaking down and we should be proud that we got it right all that time. You're just late, you know, <laughs> for the game. But that's why I'm trying to emphasize this happiness on being Muslimah. And it can work as well through modesty. I was talking to a sister yesterday, explaining how important it is to understand the rules of hijab and to be able to personalize it, you know, allowing for some people colors and, you know, like, alhamdulillah, modesty can take different shape, you know, like, you can be in Abaya and be modest, you can be in Ajiba and be modest, but as long as the rules are respected, you know, like, make fun, like, with it, like, you know, enjoy it. And I know it's a bit strange, but when I really understood the, the meaning of hijab, Allah I used to walk, like, head up, like, a, really, I feel sorry for the people that didn't wear it, and people that didn't understand, like, the deepness of the meaning. Yeah, that's one. Ben Shalai, question time. I think we had a question in the yeah. front row, so. So, like, um, so you mentioned that, obviously, it's an unnatural fitra to kind of be more feminine, to stay at home. Yeah. Doctors, for example. Yeah. So, how can you go about balancing those two things? Because obviously, it's in your fitra, but then you need it kind of in the workplace as well. I've been thinking about this question a lot those past years, uh, thinking like what for me um, will work out better for women, especially in those fields, we need them. And I don't want you to misunderstand my message. I'm just saying that many women won't have the skills to be this or to be that, and it's okay. You are still loved by Allah Azza wa Jal, even if you don't get this diploma, even if I pray that you all get it, inshallah. But even if you don't get it, we, should, we shouldn't depend on that. Even if you don't get married to that sister or to that brother, it's okay. Even if you don't have children, it's okay. Because you have to remember why Allah Azza wa Jal has created us. is to be Khalifa on earth for the woman, is to be represented, representing, representative, okay. sorry, of Allah's rules on earth. And you can do that even sick in a bed, even if you have what the society will say, nothing. You have absolutely everything. And even through your mental health, for example, some morning you wake up and you feel nothing is working for you. You can be a man and wake up and thinking like, it's not working, like I missed that exam, or work is, you know, money side, like, you know, family side, sometimes it's not working out. Even us as sisters, like, oh, my mom, my parents, this and that. And then I remember, I'm Muslim. Allah is on our side. Allah ma'ana. We'll be fine. You know? As long as this is protected, everything's going to be fine. Sometimes that's the only thing that makes me get out of bed. I'm a Muslim. And even if everything fails, Allah Azza wa didn't fail me. And I'm a Muslim. And it's very important we started to re-embrace our differences, you know, our, even our cultural differences. Did I answer your question? Because Islam didn't stop the woman from being very active. Oh yeah, let me finish that point. Well, I thought about it and I thought like, you know what is the solution for a woman to be effective when it comes to being a doctor, a teacher? Because I always thought, how they do it? 
it's kind of hard because still you have to be the wife and the mother when you go back home even though I feel like if the woman is contributing to the bills and she's helping the men should be as well contributing that's my view but I think the ideal society would be women's small um, work hours meaning that maybe for rather than being a full time maybe you only work one third of the week so any shared between different sisters so it allows you to still be a wife to still be a woman because that's extremely traumatic can you imagine I know the society standards for the men are there but we're asking you to be a woman still beautiful healthy makeup wise like gym and cooking instagrammable plate but we're asking you to be a man as well at work you know to exceed your goals and this and that and to maybe progress that is crazy meaning you we're asking you to be stronger than men or to do more than them and i really believe until the men may be understood that I, I last time i was listening to a couple obviously they're moving to london they're getting married bills are very expensive rent is extremely expensive but as long as they're both contributing to the bills the brother like if they were meeting for marriage is accepting the fact that he has to contribute she didn't need to ask he said because she's contributing in my duty I'm gonna contribute in her duty in terms of housework and you know because after all she, she she's coming back home as tired as you are and plus she's the one that's washing the kids putting the kids to sleep feeding them cooking cleaning men needs to understand like how hard it is and alhamdulillah if she's contributing to help you guys on paying the bills and making it easy for you make it easy for, for, for the wives as well it's extremely important and Allah doesn't like oppression Allah is very fair he's adil he's just subhanallah so yes you can still have a career but I will always advise sisters that wants to be wives like happy wives and and happy mothers is to lower the work hours if they can in the ideal society they should do that you know yeah, that was my answer. I hope you... Does it make sense? Yes. Okay, Jazakallah. Okay. Jazakallah. Um, thank you, everyone, for a lot of the questions that we have in. I'll repeat the Slido code again. It's 3682060, inshallah. Um, so one of our most popular questions is, what are the six rules of hijab that you mentioned? Oh. <laughs> yes, that would okay. be I should have write them down before coming, because not everyone agrees. Some say six, some say seven. Um, please some, uh, help me if you can, if I forget one of them because uh, I did write that okay I explained to you my little story I used to go at university this is when I started to wear hijab because it was allowed okay and I had to literally run to the masjid you know like we had a little masjid small little like basement outside the uni to go and pray at that time we didn't have like we didn't have prayer facility like you guys so we had to literally like leg it to, to do the salat and um, I remember like being confused because I saw women coming in in jeans, in leggings, in skirts, have hijab, I don't mind. Like, you can be like, you, we all on our different journey. I'm very tolerant when it comes to that. But came the salat time, and some sisters wanted to lead the salat in leggings. And I was like, mm, I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure that's gonna work. You know when you know like the condition of like salat and how the malaika come to exhaust your dua and everything, and I was like, okay. If I need to go buy it through hikmah, wisdom. So what I decided to do is to make some research because maybe it's my view that it's not, uh, uh, it's not haya, it's not covered enough for salat. Maybe that's my own view, maybe that's my own perception. So I was like, okay, I'm gonna make some research. And what I did, I, I built a poster, the rules <laughs> of the hijab while praying. And hopefully people will understand that praying is just like going out. But that wasn't my issue because everyone on their own journey. My issue was a sister leading salah and not covered properly. So my salah won't be validated and I don't want to hurt her feelings. So I decided to make some research and I realized that Allah is asking for clothing to be loose, not to see the shape of the body. But today in 2024 is literally having fabric on your body. A legging is considered as covered. It's not. Not in Islam. Legging is not covered. It's like trousers, we cannot see your shapes. Meaning that if you want to be like at best when it comes to covering, we cannot guess your body shape. Imagine like how far we are from the legging and all that. So when I started to put those rules like it has to be loose, the ideal will be from head to toes, 
um, no perfume, no bling bling, too, many, too much bling bling. When I mean bling bling is like LEDs on your day, and I'm joking. But like, you know, too much attractive. You can have personality, because Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, he was like, um, adapt, explaining that the rule of the hijab adapts to the country where you are. For example, if you are in a country when it's uh, all black and you come out in pink, you know, that you, you're coming out a bit of the field of like what is covered. It doesn't mean you need to, but we are in a country, alhamdulillah, we have diversity. Um, you go to Africa, you wear black, you're going to be pointed out, you know, with the African wax and the beautiful fabric colors, like you're going to stand out. But what I'm trying to explain, obviously black goes with everything in all society because it's just the first colors that uh, everyone wears. But what I'm trying to explain is like the not flashy, flashy, like, you know, maybe, I don't know. I don't have an example of what can be flashy. LEDs? <laughs> I'm not there yet. Alhamdulillah. But you can still have your personality. I think that's very important to point it out because women love to, you know, to personalize things, to wear things that fit their personality, and I'm all for it. I think you find happiness in your hijab when it goes with who you are. You know, like some will wear trainers, other boots, other like maybe, maybe not heels, but you understand what I'm trying to say. So, uh, not flashy, not perfumed, head to toes, can't show like the shape of the body and not see through, that was clear. Um, but in today's society, they have tried to play with the modest fashion so much we can barely distinguish. I knew sisters that used to cover properly, but because of social media, they have lost their ways in the hijab. You know, now they're wearing turban and they, and they call that like, yeah, maybe it is modest according to the society, but we don't do things according to society. We do things according to Allah Azza wa Jal. And when it was described that the wives of the prophets, they, they were like crow, like birds, black birds, crow. Um, they used to be called, like they used to, when they walk, they were like black birds, like, I don't know how you call crows. them. Crows. Yeah, crows. So it gives you like an idea, like how covered and how layered and how like modest they were. And you're thinking like, jeans is okay? Trousers, I'm not criticizing everyone. Everyone on their own journey. But to tell me this is modest according to Allah, this is why you always ask a sister the question, is it modest according to you, to the society, or to the rules of Allah Azza wa Jal? You know, or to, for the angel to allow them to come in the room. Angels do not come in the room if you're not covered properly. Because they have haya, subhanAllah. And it's the same rules they follow of the proper hijab. So, I think I said it all, the, all the, the rules. Yeah, and, and you can see, subhanAllah, how it is, and it has to be covered properly, okay? Because there is two, two definitions when it comes to, uh, women used to wear veil, you know like how they, like Romans, maybe you saw it on some film, they used to have like a hijab attached on the back of the hair, okay? And they used to walk around. They used to have a bit of modesty at the time, already, okay? So when the ayah of the Quran say, ask the woman, to put back the hijab over the, the, the chest. Some will translate it like this, and some will translate it like that. This is why both, some of, uh, some of the Muslim scholars will believe that niqab is wajib, is fard, according to the way they think the, the order of Allah Azza wa Jal came. Do you, do you understand what I'm trying to explain? There is two ways, either this way, because they used to wear like already a hijab, quite long actually. Either this way, or either that way. And it's according to your own translation, and I will encourage you to study, inshallah, with the shuyukh and see what uh, Islam says. But the rules are, are strict and not strict. It's just like if you can pray in it, you can go out with it. And you won't pray in leggings. I don't think so. Alhamdulillah. I think um, we only have uh, time for one or two more questions. That's okay. Um, one of the most popular ones is, what advice would you give to a sister uh, who wants to wear hijab but doesn't feel ready? I'm going to tell you the advice that um, a sister told me 15 years ago. She said there is no really... That, <laughs> that, uh, she, she was quite a funny sister, mashallah. She said, well, you were, oh, I, I need to tell you a bit. Uh, please allow me five minutes. I need to tell you a bit of my own journey when it came to the hijab. Like I told you, I'm not going to lie, I struggled with it. I didn't see the purpose of it. But what I used to do is every Friday at Jumu'ah, I used to wear it. Go to the masjid and more... Week after week, I struggled a bit more and more to remove it. 
and I was in, a, in the train with a Caribbean sister. I need to explain to you her story so you understand her strength and her comment that she made towards me that was a bit rude. She was a revert sister and actually at the time I'm talk I was talking with her and I was going back from the journey from uh, uh, the mosque in Paris, the biggest mosque in Paris, to my like, uh, we live in the suburb. So we're taking the train, so I'm sat with her. And at that time, subhanAllah, she was homeless because of her hijab. So it made me feel very, in, not uncomfortable, but as a Muslim, obviously, it made me question. I'm thinking, subhanAllah, she's sacrificing her, the comfort of her home only for the hijab. She was a very strong Caribbean sister, very strong, like uh, she was charismatic. And when she saw me, I got up on the train and slowly, like, start to, like, unpin the hijab and, like, you know, discreetly, I was like, I was starting to have the move, like, you know, like, just slide, like, the hijab. And she was like, what are you doing? In front of everyone. What do you think you're doing? Ah, you want to remove the hijab, huh? I have to, in front of everyone, me, I was like, oh, oh no, don't do that to me, please, Amina, don't do that to me. And she said, with her Caribbean accent, what are you going to say to Allah? What are you going to say to Allah? Huh? If you die, if you come out like and die, the bus like pro. I said, Amina, we don't need to go there. Please, just let me. And I was like begging for the door to open because I was starting to be very upset. I'm Algerian, okay? I get upset, okay? A bit more than the normal. <laughs> but I was like starting to be very like, my nerves, you know, shaitan was starting to kick in like, how she's talking to me in front of everyone. So I was walking out like, I didn't take it off. I was walking out of the train like walking like, like this, like, oh, who she thinks she is and talking to me like that like like no you don't do that in public like whatever and then shaitan voices i said so i said and then the f the fog of like anger start to dissipate and i started to focus on what she was saying like the hack of what she was saying and i'm starting to remember the story of what she said like if a bus like like you know if you die like on the car accident whatever what are you going to say to allah and then i remembered She's in the street. She is homeless. And my parents are Muslim. They are really struggling with the idea of hijab. You have to understand, my parents didn't struggle with the fact that hijab is not haq. They knew I would be rejected by the society. They knew I could say bye-bye to my studies. And I was a good student. I was going to uni, so my mother, you know how they are, the parents, they're very proud, like the first daughters going to uni and making big studies and everything. It was a proudness for her. And I can understand, mashallah, coming from where she comes. And I was like walking and the more her voice kept coming back to my head. And she couldn't say it in a better way. And she couldn't have made it another manner. Allah Azza wa knew how to guide me. So this is what I'm saying like, don't wait. And she said like, are you waiting for the sky to open like in two and the Quran will come down to tell you where it? In front of everyone. And I was like, truly she's right. What am I waiting for? The willing is me. If I decide, I can wear it tomorrow. And this is exactly what happened. I never removed it from that day on, subhanAllah. And I knocked at the door, my mother didn't know. And like my sister opened the door like quickly and I removed it. Because I didn't want to anger my mom, like I didn't want to surprise her, take her, take her off guard. I, my mother like, I'm pretending I'm helping her peeling the potatoes, going in the kitchen, what I never do. <laughs> and I was like, mama wearing the hijab. And I go out of the kitchen very quickly. She was like, oh, come back, come back, come back, come back. I said, Mama, I'm wearing the hijab because I don't want to be punished. I don't want to go to hellfire. It's as simple as that. So my mom was like, she couldn't say anything. SubhanAllah. So my, my advice would be for someone that is struggling is to go back to Allah Azza wa Jal's names. Remember who is Allah. Remember like that everything that Allah Azza wa Jal will do for you when you start to walk towards him. And hijab is one of those ibadah. Hijab is an ibadah. It's something that will bring you barakah. It's something that will bring you blessing upon a blessing. And you, sister, don't think you will understand the hijab. Like I told you honestly, you will understand it when you wear it. There are certain things you will understand a bit, but the real true meaning of hijab is when you do it. It's like salat. People can talk to you about salat, but you understand it when you do it. Hijab is exactly the same. And I never thought I would say that. I understood the meaning of hijab after. So don't worry about it. Don't think like, oh yeah, but shaitan, no. Just ask Allah Azza wa to put the love of the hijab in your heart. Wallahi, and that's exactly what I did. Even though I didn't like it at the time. I hope this helped, inshallah.